unmute myself here. There we are. So let's look at the schedule. We're in September 14th through the 17th. So we're starting chapter five and um, we'll get through as much as we can today. We'll, we'll probably have to finish uh, on Monday. You do have a quiz, probably we'll open it uh, tomorrow or Friday and you'll have probably a couple of days where you can get it done, okay? So um, that quiz will be over chapter four, which is skin and body membranes, which we already covered. So just wanna make sure you're aware of that, that you do have a quiz this week. And then we have a week off and then you have an exam, okay? But in lab, I believe you all have a quiz next week in lab, so. All right. So let's talk about skeletal system. Actually, yeah, make sure it fits in the screen, right? So what does the skeletal system do? Provides, obviously provides support or structure, also pro protects your internal organs, right? So your rib cage protects your heart and your lungs. Produces blood cells, okay, in the bone marrow. Can store nutrients. And it helps you move. And I added this document this morning, so it is in Canvas, so you can look at it. Mm -hmm. All right. Is this well, this is an old version, oh. and so in this, this is the older version of the textbook, and it was chapter six. That the content is skeletal system. Okay, so don't worry about the numbers. Just want to make sure that the content matches what you're supposed to be studying each week. All right. So what we're going to learn, we're going to learn about the anatomy of a long bone. We're going to learn about how bones grow and repair themselves. We're going to learn about surface features okay, of the bones. So how do we classify bones? Well, you can classify them based on their shape. So if they're longer than they are wide, we call them long bones. Things like your femur, your humerus. If they are cube shaped, we call them short bones. If they're plate-like and have broad surfaces, we can call them flat bones, like some of the bones in your skull. They have varied shapes, call them irregular, like your vertebrae. If they're circular in shape, you call them round, like your patella. All right, so long bones, let's start there. So on the outside of the long bone, you have periosteum. So peri is an outer covering. All right, so I know in the lab, and if you look at the lab practical review, there's a question about layers. This kind of gives you a little bit of information about layers here as well. So here's an overlap. So it's tough, it's connective tissue. Now, the essentially the shaft of the bone is or extended portion is your epiphysis. All right, everybody say it with me, epiphysis. All right, and the portion, and actually I would say like, so epi is actually the end. So let me draw it. 
So you got your bone. Right. This is the femur. So this is an epiphysis on the end of the bone, and the other end of the bone is another epiphysis. And the shaft is actually diaphysis. So say diaphysis. Okay. So in between the diaphysis, you have, the, or in between the epiphyses, you have the diaphysis. All right. So you also have inside the bone. If we were to do a transverse cut, you would see a medullary cavity. And it's a hollow portion in the diaphysis. So I have yellow marrow there. Now on the ends of these diaphyses, particularly, this is not drawn perfectly, but say this is your tibia, right? And you have your fibula next to it. These connections here of these bones on the surfaces you have articular cartilage. So it's hyaline cartilage, helps keep the bones from smashing into each other when you move. Now in that medullary cavity, in the spaces of the spongy bone on the inside of your bone, you have endosteum. So on the outer surface, so here we're looking at the bone Outer surface, periosteum. Outer lining of the bone. On the inner surface, you have endosteum. inner lining of the bone. Okay. And here you also have spongy bone kind of weaved in there. So where the endosteum is, you also see spongy bone. And where you see the outer layer, all that compact bone. And we'll get into that later. I just, since we're drawing it, I want to go ahead and put that in there. Ah, compact bone, spongy bone. So inside your bones, you have these structures called osteons. And they are made of these concentric rings or layers of matrix. We call those lamellae. What do they have in them? They have collagen fibers. Remember when we learned about collagen? Okay, part of connective tissue. And they also have mineral salts. All right, you know, you need minerals for your bones. Now you also have little spaces called lacunae. And that's where your osteocytes or bone cells live. Remember osteo means bone, site means cell. You also have spongy bone and it has these plates and bars called trabeculae. So it's that kind of mesh work. And they follow the lines of stress in your bone and makes your bone strong. All right, so let me, it's kind of hard to see here, but here you have, there's an osteon, there's a set of rings. Here's another osteon, another set of rings, another osteon, another set of rings. This is kind of what each ring looks like, each lamella. These little depressions in each lamella, those are your lacunae where the osteocytes live. And here's an, an osteocyte.
All right. Now, how do bones grow and repair? Well, you have several different kinds of cells involved. So progenitor typically means these are your precursor. These are your kind of like your stem cells. They are very unspecialized. And remember osseo, osseo is bone. And they give rise to osteoblasts and these cells form bone. So usually if you see blasts like fibroblasts make collagen, osteoblasts make the bone. Osteocytes are your mature bone cells. And if you see class, class means breaking down. So they're cells that break down the bone. And there's this constant dynamic or homeostasis going on where bones being made and bones being broken down. You have too much building up, bones get too thick, too, too big. Too much breaking down, they get weak. All right, so for ossification, which means making bone, it's two processes. One is intramembranous ossification, the other is endochondral. So intramembranous ossification, your bone gets made between these sheets of fibrous connective tissue. So it's kind of inside, intra. And it's used to make the bones of your skull in particular. And that should make sense because if you're in between two sheets, your bones should be kind of flat, which, you know, the bones in the skull are called flat bones. Endochondral ossification is where most of the bones do to grow. And this is actually taking hyaline cartilage, remember we learned about cartilage, and replacing that cartilage with bone. So if you take AMP1, it gets a lot more detail than that, but I'll tell you, at least for this class, that's all you need to know about the two types of ossification. All right, so the epiphyseal plate. So like for endochondral ossification, you have this band of cartilage that's in your epiphyses of the long bones. Okay, and, and the bone will just continue to grow longer and longer until that epiphyseal plate becomes ossified. Okay, so it becomes mature. So endochondral ossification makes the bone longer. Appositional growth makes the bone wider. Okay, so that's a big difference. Okay, so your bones can get longer, they can also get thicker. Okay. All right, so this is a diagram of endochondral ossification. So you start with your cartilaginous model, so your model of cartilage. All right. You start developing periosteum, your outer covering here on the side. Okay, you start developing compact bone by the periosteum, but you also start developing on the inside of the bone what we call a primary ossification center. So that's where most of your ossification is gonna happen. And the uh, bone's going to have blood vessels supply nutrients. Okay, and as that blood vessel network gets more extensive, you get a medullary cavity. You also start developing on the epiphyses, you start developing secondary ossification centers. Okay. And 
those bones start lengthening as the secondary ossification centers is that their cartilage starts being changed to bone. Eventually, there's no more cartilage to change in the bone and it just becomes spongy bone, okay, and it's mature. And in the inside of your medullary cavity, you now have bone marrow. All right, so let's take a break and you can talk to your partner about types of ossification. And if you're at home, you can be playing along as well. All right, so as I mentioned before, there's this dynamic between the osteoblast and the osteoclast, and that remodels the bone over time. So your bone gets broken down and built up. The osteocytes get rid of all those worn out cells and they put more calcium back in the blood. And the osteoblasts take calcium from the blood. So they use that to make new bone. Right. So what are some of the hormones that help with that or help regulate that process? So parathyroid hormones involved, calcitonin is involved, and growth hormones involved. Right, so how do you repair the bone? So if you get a fracture or a break in the bone, you need to repair it. First step is you get a, what we call a hematoma, okay, kind of a rush of blood to that area. Then you form what we call a callus, and it's basically a bunch of fibro cartilage that goes over there. And that cartilage turns into bone, becomes a bony callus, or bony callus. And then you start getting more remodeling, okay? So that building up and breaking down. So what are some of the different kinds of fractures? If you break the bone completely through, it's a complete fracture. And if the bone's not separated into two parts, it's incomplete. So if the bone pierces the skin, it's compound. And if it doesn't, it's simple. And at the ends of the bone get wedged back into each other, then it's considered impacted because they're kind of packed against each other. If the break results from some sort of twisting, you can get a spiral fracture, okay, where the way it cuts is kind of, it makes sort of a, almost like a circle. Or kind of like the way the double helix winds around. And as the fracture gets repaired, if you want to repair a fracture, it's a process that we call reduction. And if it does not require surgery, it's a closed reduction. Because you don't have to cut the person open. If you do have to use surgery, with screws, pins, or plates, it's open reduction. So, anybody ever had an, an open reduction? Anybody had to have a, okay? All right, so some real life experience with it. <laughs> all right, let's talk about some of the bones you need to know. All right, some of this is covered in lab, but you do need to know this for lecture as well. So this large bone forehead, that is your frontal bone. All right, so you can kind of see on, from this view a little bit of, on the side of the head, you can see the parietal bones. On the, on the sides of the head near where your ears are is the temporal bone. Okay, this bone that forms part of your orbit around your eye as well as your cheek bones. We call that the zygomatic bone. Your upper jaw, we call it the maxilla. Lower jaw, we call that the mandible. 
All right, so this bone here forms the kind of upper ridge of your nose, call that the nasal bone, right? Nasal region. Okay, back in the orbit, you can see a bit of the sphenoid bone. We'll get, probably get a better view of that from a diff different angle. All right, it's a little light blue area here. Kind of looks like where tears might fall. And it's the lacrimal bone. Lacrimal, lacrimal ducts are the tear ducts. Okay, this bone here, kind of orange part of your, I guess, septum with your nostrils. It's the ethmoid bone. Also, this area has what we call a perpendicular plate. And just inferior to the ethmoid bone is the vomer. And together, those two bones make up the nasal septum. These little spaces right here in green, we call those the inferior nasal concha. Okay. So these places kind of in these projections of where the, the teeth, once they go into the jaw, where it kind of raises up, we call those alveolar processes. All right, so a little bit of information here on surfaces, articulations, projections. So things that you should know. So if you ever hear the term condyle, basically means a rounded off knob on your bone. Okay. Now, just above the condyle, sometimes you'll see a smaller knob, we call it the epicondyle. And remember, epi is sort of outer or above, so that's your epicondyle. All right, so if you have a large knob on a bone, it helps create a joint, particularly more approximately, like closer to the base of your body, call that a head. So like the humerus has a head. You see, it's be a bar or a bone or something that's forming a joint with a hole called a fossa, call that a process. And we'll see some of that, but I just want to introduce you to these terms. A suture. It's basically, we're not talking about sutures in surgery. What we're talking about is basically a place where two bones come together and those bones don't move. Okay. And they basically fuse, make a real tight connection. Now, on some bones, you have what we call a slender ridge or kind of a line. So on the tibia, We'll have what we call an anterior crest. Okay, kind of a curvature. Another structure, if the knob is more triangular, we'll call it a malleolus. You'll have one of these on your tibia. If you have a thick ridge, we'll call that a spine. You'll see that on your on the scapula and on your back. Oval knobs are called trochanters. You see those on the femur. Small round knobs called tubercles. Your humerus has a greater tubercle. Large and irregular shaped knobs are called tuberosities. Tibia has one. We also have names for openings and depressions. Uh, we don't say hole, but depending on what kind of hole it is, we give it a different name. So a hole in the bone, we call that a foramen, like the foramen magnum at the base of the skull, where your spinal cord comes through. Depression in the bone is called a fossa. You have an opening to the outside, from a canal, we call that a meatus. 
So like you have the external acoustic meatus on your temporal bone, right where your ear canal is. All right, you also have sinuses. I and mean, you probably have heard this, like when you're having sinus pressure or sinus headache. These are hollow cavities in your bone. Like you have frontal sinus in your frontal bone. Yes, exactly. So they can get filled up with you know, mucus and build up pressure. All right, more, more bones to know. So the skull is composed of the face and the cranium, you have facial bones, and then you have the cranium. All right, at the base of the throat, you have what we call the hyoid bone. And, and interestingly, the hyoid bone doesn't articulate with other bones. Okay, it's basically um, held together, held there by connective tissue. Okay. We don't say collarbone, we say clavicle. We don't say shoulder blade, we say scapula. Okay, you have your sternum, it connects to your rib cage or the ribs. I'll see the vertebral column, hips are the coxal bones. Okay. And that forms basically your axial skeleton, your appendicular skeleton, again, your pectoral girdle, your clavicle and your scapula, your humerus, your radius and ulna, carpals in the wrists, metacarpals in the hands, and the phalanges at the fingers. All right, again, with the Pelvic girdle, you have the coxal bones, femur, patella, the tibia and fibula, the tarsals in the ankle, metatarsals in the base of the foot, and the phalanges, the toes. Again, axial skeleton. So at the midline, Composed of your skull, your hyoid bone, your vertebral column, your thoracic cage, which is your sternum and your ribs, and your middle, middle ear bones. Okay? That's your axial skeleton. So for your skull, compose of your cranium, top of the skull and the facial bones. Again, we mentioned those sinuses earlier. These are air spaces within your bones. Have mucous membranes in them. And they basically serve to reduce the weight of the skull because it's air instead of bone there. All right, so they make your voice resonate because it's resonating inside of those air spaces. You also have what we call paranasal sinuses. Okay, you got four of those, your maxillary and maxilla, frontal, frontal bone, sphenoidal for sphenoid bone, ethmoidal for the ethmoid bone. You also have a mastoid sinus. Okay, another view, sagittal view, right? Mid sagittal. Okay. Another view of the frontal bone. Here's a coronal suture. This is like a frontal or coronal section this way. Here's your parietal bone. So your frontal suture separates your frontal bone from your parietal bone. Landoid suture separates your parietal bone from your occipital bone. Your 
squamous suture separates your parotid bone from your temporal bone. Okay. All right, let's see. Here's another view you can get of the ethmoid bone. Okay, here's your, what we call it, we saw that perpendicular plate. The space here is called the crystal Here's that frontal sinus, that airspace with the frontal bone. Nasal bone, another view of the vomer, okay, a lot bigger than it looks like from the front. Palatine bone. Okay, think about the cooking shows and they talk about having a, a palate, you know, being able to taste certain things, All right? All right, here's your maxilla, your mandible. Large hole here is the foramen magnum. And this little hole here, for your sphenoid bone, this is the cella tersica. So this is actually on the inside of your head. So your temple is part of your temporal bone. All right, so again, what does your cranium do? Obviously it protects your brain. Those sutures make those joints immovable between those bones. You know, we just saw these bones. So it's composed of your frontal bone, parietal bone, occipital bone, temporal bones. On the temporal bone, you'd see the external auditory meatus for your ear canal. You also have a mandibular fossa, a mastoid process, a styloid process and zygomatic process. You also have a sphenoid bone, ethmoid bone. We talked about some of the structures there already. Like the crystal and the cribriform plate and the perpendicular plate. Also, that's where the superior middle nasal conchae are. And I know you'll see some of this in lab, but I just want you to be exposed to it here as well. All right, so I think we've looked at this view already. All right, so here's your temporal bone, your parietal bone, frontal bone, another view of that coronal suture, another view of the squamosal suture separating parietal from the temporal bone. Here's your lambdoidal suture separating your occipital and your parietal bones. Here's another view of that external auditory meatus. Some kind of big bump here is your mastoid process. We just talked about that. Pointing one is your styloid process. To me, it looks like a stylus. Anybody ever use a stylus for a, a tablet or a you know, iPad or a phone? It's kind of like that. All right. Um, All right, so up here you've got mandibular condyle. So that's a structure like where the mandible connects here to the temporal bone. Okay, this space here, call it the mandibular angle. There's an angle there. All right. Okay, so here's your structure here. We call it the zygomatic arch because it kind of curves. And it's made up of both bones. So this is the, and we call it basically, the process is named by the bone it's attached to. So this is the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. So it's touching the temporal, it's, it's touching the zygomatic bone over here. Right here, this is the temporal process of the zygomatic bone because it's touching the temporal bone. Okay, another view nasal bone, maxilla, lacrimal bone, mandible. All right. Down here it tells you this is the coronoid process of the mandible. Another view, inferior view, big view of the occipital bone here, foramen magnum, big hole there. So occipital condyle, okay, another view of that mastoid process on your temporal bone. It's depression or hole is a mandibular fossa. Another view here, that pointy styloid process. 
You see the zygomatic arch again, temporal process of the zygomatic bone and a zygomatic process of the temporal bone. It's your palatine bone again, maxilla. All right, so you can get a little view of the vomer from this angle. This big thing, and to me, this looks like elephant ears. In my mind, I, I guess that's the, what it looks like to me. That's, a, that's probably the best view you'll get other than, again, cutting off this part of the skull of the sphenoid bone. This is what it looks like, again, if you did a transverse section cutting off the top of the skull. There's your sphenoid bone, cella tersica. Here's your ethmoid bone with the crystagalli and cribriform plate. Big frontal bone, frontal sinus. And it's where your sinus pressure builds up in your forehead, right? Another view of the temporal bone, another view of the parietal bone, another view of the occipital bone. Here's your foramen magnum. So the face, we just covered a lot of this. You have the maxilla, palatine bone, zygomatic bone, lacrimal bone, nasal bone, bomer bone. And you can see the inferior nasal concha and the mandible, the lower jaw. Okay, that hyoid bone, remember I mentioned that earlier. Superior to the larynx in your throat. It's the only bone that doesn't articulate with another bone. It's actually anchored to your tongue. And it serves as a site of attachment for the muscles associated with swallowing. And your vertebral column provides support for your rib cage. And it serves as a point of attachment for your pelvic girdle. And that's basically your hip bones, right? It also helps protect your spinal cord. It has a series of different bones named for their location. So you have a section of seven cervical vertebrae in the neck, 12 thoracic vertebrae in the chest, five lumbar vertebrae in the lower back, five sacral bones below that. And then you, then you have the coccyx, which is made up of three to five little bones. But we generally just refer to it as the coccyx. All right, and they are naturally curved. So here's your cervical vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae, lumbar vertebrae, sacrum and the coccyx. All right, so they want you to see here, these are facets, these are flat surfaces that articulate with the rib cage. Okay, and, that, and articulate is just a fancy word for bones touching each other, okay, or movement. So it tells you here a little more about the curvature of the uh, skeleton or of the vertebrae. So we say that the cervical vertebrae and the lumbar vertebrae are convex, the thoracic vertebrae and the sacral vertebrae are concave. They give you support and balance. Now, what are the medical applications of this? Well, if you have an exaggerated lumbar curvature, it's called lordosis. And if you have increased roundness in your thoracic curvature, that's called kyphosis. And you may probably be more familiar with scoliosis. I know at least when I was growing up, they all used to check kids for scoliosis. I don't know if they do that anymore, but <laughs> at least when I was a kid, that was like the big thing everybody checked for was scoliosis and lice. Like they didn't check for anything else, but they want to make sure you didn't have scoliosis, you didn't have lice. Um, so it basically just means you have abnormal lateral curvature usually in the thoracic region. So it's usually like people that are hunched over like that in the thoracic region. All right, so you got some different views here. Again, the lordosis, kyphosis, and the scoliosis. All right. 
Use your axial skeleton. So here, let's talk about the intervertebral disc. So in the vertebrae. So the intervertebral disc just means they're disc between the different vertebrae. So what are they good for? They keep the vertebrae from grinding up on each other. And they absorb shock. They'll allow motion between the vertebrae. So there's a, you have a bit of movement. Okay. So what do the vertebrae do? Well, let's actually, before we do that, let's talk about different parts. So the portion toward the front of the body or anterior portion is called a body. And they all should have a, a foramen or vertebral foramen so the spinal cord can go through it. And they all have bony projections so muscles can attach. Some important vertebrae you need to know. First cervical vertebrae is known as the atlas. Provide support for your head, allows you to move your head up and down. So you nod your head, you know, you're using your atlas. The axis, second cervical vertebrae, allows you to pivot your atlas. So it allows you to move your head from side to side. So if you're saying no, you're using your axis. Okay. All right. Your sacrum, so let's go to the other end of the spinal cord. Sacrum, you have sacral vertebrae that are fused together. And it forms the posterior wall or back wall of the pelvic cavity. And you have your coccyx. And it's three to five vertebrae that have been fused together. All right, so here's a view vertebrae, some different structures you need to know. Here's a spinous process. If you think about it like a house, you have your flagpole, which is your spinous process or your chimney. The lamina forms your roof. The ends of that roof, we have what we call transverse process because they're sticking out horizontal. All right, the walls, we call those pedicles. In the Basically the foundation or the hill, we call that the body. And that's the basic structure. So here's a spinous process, a transverse process, it's your lamina up here, your pedicles, right? Your body. Again, facets are just places where you have connection with some other bone. Here's your vertebral foramen for the spinal cord. Right, your lamina and your pedicle together make up what we call vertebral arch. So if you think about it, it looks like an arch. All right, so let's take a break and you can talk about what you learned with your partner about the vertebrae. And you can do this at home as well, test what you learned. All right, so let's talk about the rib cage. Provides protection for your lungs and your heart. So it allows for support for your bones and your pectoral girdle. Remember that's your scapula. Okay, that's your scapula and your clavicle. So the ribs, you have 12 pairs of them. And they're gonna connect to your thoracic vertebrae. All right, you have true ribs. The first seven pairs are true ribs, so they directly connect to the sternum. And I'll kind of tell you, it says true and false. I would say true floating and false. So eight through 10 attach indirectly to the sternum via rib number seven. So we'll call those floating. Ribs 11 and 12 don't attach at all, so we call those false. Actually, we'll call those, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. So we'll call those 
those are the floating because they're not attaching at all. But the rooms A through 10 will attach indirectly, so they're false rows. So my apologies, make sure you write it the right way. Ribs 8 through 10 are false, ribs 10 through 12 are floating. All right, sternum. So, center of the chest, it's flat, it's blade shaped. To me, it looks like a necktie. Um, has three bones that are fused together, a manubrium, a body, and a xiphoid process. So here's a view of these ribs and the sternum. So the base of your tie is the manubrium, length of the tie is the body, tip of the tie is the xiphoid process. Yes. Yes, so we're actually gonna do that right here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, those are true. Eight through nine connects indirectly, or eight through 10 rather connects indirectly. So those are false ribs. So ribs eight through 10 are false ribs. They connect indirectly to the spinal cord, or indirectly to the sternum. So I'll show you that here. False ribs, if they attach indirectly to the sternum, they're false ribs. So, so I will two ribs. I'm sorry. Floating ribs. Or Eleven through twelve. Put that over here. Don't attach. All right, so the false ribs, and I'll just add a little piece here underneath. They attach indirectly. So does that help at all? Well, that, that's why, because I don't like the way it's written here, and I was trying to make sure that you knew, and I, I think I confused you more and that helps you, but the point is, there's true, false, floating. True is one through seven, false, eight through 10, floating, 11 and 12, okay? The false are false because they attach indirectly. Floating or floating because they don't attach at all. They're just, they're kind of floating there because they're not attached. So, um, are you sure so there are three types of ribs that we have? Yes. Okay. So, if you see a test question, answer it based on there being three types. And, you know, just answer it that way. And that goes for both lecture and lab. All right, so let me when I clear my drawings. All right. All right, so I'm gonna pause one more time. So it's just talk generally about the parts of the axial skeleton. Okay, so with the pectoral girdle, this is part of the appendicular skeleton. I'll have that list on this side. Is it 
on your skull. Yeah, sorry. This is column. Sorry, I know it really small, but it's vertebral column. This is the clavicle and the scapula. So your clavicles articulate with the manubrium of the sternum. That's the only attachment we have to the axial skeleton. It braces the scapula and stabilizes your shoulder. Your scapula connect to your spine. Well, they don't really connect to your spine. Really what that's meaning is that they actually have kind of a spine and runs along them. So on the back of it, because it, it looks kind of like the T-bone steak in the back. So I know it's probably not time to be talking about food, but it is what it is. But yeah, okay, Dorito, whatever you. So, but it actually has a spine that runs along it. Okay, so the uh, there's some processes we're going to see. We're going to see the chromium process, the coracoid process, and the glenoid cavity. All right, so here's your clavicle again. Up here, here's your scapula. This space here where the head of the humerus articulates with the scapula is called the glenoid cavity. And this little connect, little curvature, pointy curvature there, this coracoid process. Here's your spine of your scapula. Another view of that coracoid process from the posterior view. This ridge or big bump here is a chromium process. So maybe you remember in your body landmarks, there was an acromial landmark because of the acromion. Another view of that glenoid cavity, your acromion, that coracoid process. One thing I do want to point out, the ribs, they connect to the clavicle and the, or they connect to the, the sternum via cartilage. They don't connect directly. There's some cartilage there. All right, let's talk about the upper limb. So we don't say arm, we say upper limb. So the humerus is a long bone in the arm. And as we said before, head is going to communicate or articulate with that glenoid cavity in the scapula. And I don't want to read all that to you, but you have different structures here, the greater and lesser tubercles, inner tubercular groove, you have tuberosities, all right? But Basically, it's the long bone in your arm, right? Okay, so here are some of those structures. I think it's easier to show you where they are rather than to uh, just read them off the uh, slide. So you have a head and you have a neck, right? Connects it to the rest of the body. You have a big bump, greater tubercle, smaller bump, lesser tubercle. You have Kind of a groove underneath the bump, call that an intertubercular groove. Okay. All right, so here's the surgical neck. This is the anatomical neck, but I will basically just know the neck area connects to the head. This bump here is a deltoid tuberosity. Yes, basically it's a notch or a bump. So it's not, if you think about it in the arm, in the, or not so much in the arm, but 
on your shoulder, you have a deltoid bone or deltoid muscle. It doesn't this, I mean, it's not necessarily an attachment point, but I guess, it, yeah, it actually is an attachment point, but that's, you heard about the deltoid region of the, the body or landmark. You know, there is some degree of connection there. All right, let's see. Heard about the epicondyles. This is lateral because it's on the outside of the body. Medial is going to move toward the midline. Okay, you have a trochlea, the capitulum. Okay, think about it with a pulley. You have a trochlea. Basically, it's allow your forearm to move along it. Forms a smooth surface. You have some fossas, little holes. Okay, your radius and your ulna. All right, so you have radius is going to be on the lateral side of your forearm. So if you hold your arm out with your thumb out, the radius. They are on the same side as your thumb. Okay, it's the shorter of the two, the ulna is the longer bone. Okay. okay, good view. This part of the ulna, you have this big C. See, it has a trochlear notch in it. This big bump at the top is called olecranon process. The bottom part of the C is a coronoid process. This little notch here is a radial notch because it touches the radius. Okay. But you can see here how the radius and ulna sit together. All right, you get your hand. Carpal bones are in your wrist. You have eight carpal bones, metacarpal bones in your palm of your hand, and you have your phalanges, which are your fingers. Okay, your thumb's got two phalanges. You have a proximal and a distal phalange. All right, look at your thumb. It's two bones. The other fingers have three bones, right? Proximal, middle, and distal. Remember, proximal is closer to the base, distal is closer toward the extremities. Okay, another view here carpal bones, metacarpals, phalanges. Here's proximal and distal, proximal, middle, and distal. All right, so we'll get into the pelvic girdle on Monday. Let's go ahead and do our exit tickets. Yes. Good question. So we are in week five. So I put them here at the top. There's full notes and there's also another handout. This is full notes. But you also have a Khan Academy module to practice on. You have AMP help videos on the axial skeleton, appendicular skeleton, articulations, sections of the book, okay, practice test, okay. All right. You, Yes, so when we come back on Monday, we'll finish chapter five and hopefully start chapter six. No, it's just, this is an old version of the book. The PowerPoint's an old version in that book, it was chapter six. Yeah. So I'm gonna change the title so it just says scalable system, because I think it, you know it's confusing. So there you go. It was to say skeletal system, full notes.
Okay, for today? Okay, let me fix that for you. Turn off the video for you.